Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 576, with our fourth retaping. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, on the 21st of February, 2020. You know, sometimes a show is going to be so good that we have to retape it a couple times because we go down this rabbit trail without knowing where the end is. When we finally figure out the end, oh, we need to retape. Let's stop, stop, let's, just, let's do it. Okay, so I think we have the end game of this show. Before we get to the rabbit trail and the end game, you have a responsibility as a faithful viewer, and that is to like us on Facebook and YouTube. You just click that little thumbs up and that lets these massive algorithms that are in the Google complex and the Facebook complex know that, ooh, what's this unscripted thing? I should look at it, I should promote it more. And uh, more people should see it, find it and watch it. We want you to do that. Also, if you're not subscribed to the program, now's a good chance. There's a little red rectangle on the YouTube channel. Click that, a little bell will pop up and you click that bell and you are subscribed to our program. If, let's see, what, what haven't I mentioned? Comments. I've not mentioned the comments yet today. That's where this show continues. I click stop. I click upload. I do my little edits, add the credits. After that, the show goes on, as far as I can tell, forever, because the comments are not just occurring on the last episode, but we have people commenting on episodes years ago because the conversation continues. This is relevant information to what's happening in society, culture, and the church today. So we appreciate you continuing that with us. And if you don't have time to watch us on your TV or your phone or your computer, we have a podcast available for your phone, iPhone, whatever you want to use. Uh, you can go to the show notes on YouTube and click the download for that. All right, I got all that out of the way to say, <gasps> put your seatbelts on. This is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about spirits and principalities. Before uh -oh. we do, before we do, Kevin, if I say, oh, in a conversation, if I say the words Justin Bieber, uh, Taylor Swift, and Kim Kardashian, will that do anything to our YouTube ranking? Will I'm uh, sure it will. I can't, and I'm going to put that in the show. So if I just say to, Justin Bieber, <laughs> Justin uh, Bieber, Taylor yeah. Swift, and Kim Kardashian, it will it will <laughs> have nothing to do with our topic for the day, but it might bring some people to view up who wouldn't either do otherwise do so. And yet, if you said Bruce Jenner, you'd probably get banned. So it's just how, how the algorithms work. So let's um, talk about uh, kind of visually versus spiritually what's been happening over the last decade or so in the church. And I kind of want to start off with the statistician who looked at the Episcopal Church and said, by 2040, the game is up. Everything you tried, um, whether it was you know, affirming culture or bringing the worst of culture into the church or having your U2 Eucharist or having your ashes to go, all that you tried to do was for not. The game is over in 2040. Can you give us that story, George? A uh, Lutheran professor from Wartburg Seminary was commissioned by the Episcopal Church's Executive Council, which is the body that sort of runs the show between meetings of general convention, to give a demographic report on the Episcopal Church. And she reported uh, last week that the if the trends continue, the last Episcopal Church will be closed in 2040, that the uh, decline is accelerating, uh, it's aging, and it is not uh, on a macro level. The Episcopal Church is going to, is like the Anglican Church of Canada. It's time to liquidate and redeploy the axis because the the church is dead this was her report and that they need to wake up and do something was her recommendation did she have any particulars what to do no but i think that because i the think they've executive tried everything council, no well the executive council said well we just need to do what we're doing but do more of it ah we need to have more uh woke uh issues we need to be marching more aggressively we need to pick up the latest issues of the bernie sanders campaign and uh, christianize them um i'm being silly of course but the, the problem is that when you have this report 
Now, my church has doubled in the last seven years, and it's not because all these people moved to Florida. The county's only grown 1% a year. What's happened is that the gospel is preached, and I can point to a whole number of churches, Episcopal, uh, Anglican, who have just done very well in this past few years. And what is the key, what is the, and as well as uh, traditional Catholics and Orthodox, it's not, or in Pentecostals, it's not that there's uh, some technique or some preferred way of doing church, but that the universal, the universal line that I, we see across is taking seriously the Bible and the presence and practice and power of God in their life and worship and being. And when that takes place, churches flourish. Gavin, we see the same in the Church of England. Uh, the churches are not full. Most churches have 20, uh, 30 people on a Sunday. Uh, they're suffering financial crisis. Uh, it's just bad news in the Church of England as well. And I think they've also tried to affirm culture, tried to affirm the world, and uh, given up completely on the gospel. I think that's right. It's as if we haven't, we're not struggling with the right enemy. <clears throat> that, that we're involved in a in a struggle for sure, but but we've got the wrong one. And um, I'd like to give George the credit for this idea because in one of our previous shows, it was it was he who I think began to nail the diagnosis. George, you you were you were uh, well. Before I ask you to talk about Justin Welby's address, to set the thing in context, we have three languages. Um, in the church at the moment. Uh, one of them is the one we've all been brought up with, which is the, the enlightenment language of, of theology, an exchange of theology. And we often find as we try and aim for the health of the church, and we do it in the comments, you know, your, your theological ideas are wrong. If only you'd adopt these theological ideas, everything would come right. Okay. And, and although we're very prone to do that, and this is our kind of our most natural arena uh, for many of us with degrees, that doesn't work <laughs> or if it did we'd be cooking on gas then there's another language which is the language of psychotherapy uh which is the if, if only i can find myself to be to to, to fulfill my potential to deal with my neuroses to um uh, to, to have a safe space or, or whatever particular the flavor uh, of therapeutic intervention is at the moment then then everything will be okay and you constantly hear in general synod at the moment the plea for the safe space and for the inclusion of the marginalized, no longer a political concept, but a therapeutic one. But there's a third language. And the third language is a language of deliverance and the conflict between good and evil. And it, it was reintroduced to the church uh, from, the, from, uh, from the Catholic tradition mainly by the charismatic movement in the 1960s and 70s. And immediately people got very worried about it because I remember constantly being told, you don't want to have anything to do with these charismatics. Oh my, they see demons everywhere. Everything for them is 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 demonic, and you know clearly they're mad. Um, I, I, in the intervening years, I've decided that that everything is demonic, and and, and they weren't mad. Um, George, what was your remark? What's your perception of of Justin Welby's half diagnosis at the beginning of Synod? Yeah. Justin Bieber. Oh, I'm sorry, Justin <laughs> Welby's. Uh, <laughs> In his presidential address to General Synod, Justin Welby left the script. He may may not have deliberately done this. It may have been uh, just his heart speaking out. But he, he, yes, he bleated on about climate change and racism and Brexit and all the usual drivel that uh, archbishops get up to at General Synod. But he also used a, an illusion of uh, spiritual warfare. He cited that the internal struggles of the Church of England are tearing it apart, the internal struggles of the Anglican world are tearing itself apart, and safeguarding the Church's failures to deal Christianly and competently with the cover-up culture and the abuse culture have the potential to destroy the Church. And Justin Welby then brings a, an allusion to First Peter, our enemy Satan is a roaring lion that prowls about seeking to devour us. And the way Justin Welby, G Gavin's explanation of this, I think, is the best way. So I'll, I'll leave that line to you. But Justin no, ahead, Welby, in the well, Justin Welby had enough of a charismatic background to realize that there was a spiritual issue at play. 
but he's either lost it or never had it to realize what the solution might be. The surviving church blog, which we reprint with their permission from time to time in Anglican Inc., looked at this particular aspect of Welby's uh, speech and said, you know, Welby's imagery of the lion is a fearfulness. He's a fearful man. He doesn't know what to do. He is desperately trying to hold things together, and the only way to hold things together is... Uh, do you remember the old World War II movies and the destroyers would have these smoke generators to lay down fog so that the enemy can't see you? Justin Welby is laying down fog. He's a smoke generator. He has no knowledge of how to go forward other than to obfuscate. And the Surviving Church uh, blog made the point that it is a shame that Justin Welby didn't also have the image of the lion in his mind when he talked about C.S. Lewis's Narnia books in Aslan where the lion is the symbol of the power, the majesty, and the un, unbelievably great love of Christ. For Welby, he knows there's a problem, but he just doesn't know what to do. And he know, he's, un, he's smart enough to know he has a spiritual problem, but he's unwilling to enter the war against the principalities and powers. And, here, and here's the transition. We now are to the point where we have uh, to inform Welby that there's something just beyond what you're seeing. And we are told in the New Testament that this is not a war of flesh. This is a war of spirits and principalities. That every morning when you get up, there is a fight for the soul of the church. There is a fight for the soul of the believer. There is a fight for the gospel. And that fight happens not always with what you're seeing. And, and if, I, go ahead. If we look at the narrative of the Gospels, we see they open <clears throat> with a confrontation between Jesus and Satan, a very, a very real and a very personal one. And interestingly enough, Satan's main trick is to come to Jesus with Scripture. So um, it, it's, Satan is Bible believing. He quotes scripture. It's just he's quoting the wrong one to the wrong effect. Um, and at the end, our Lord in John says, the ruler of the world, this world is coming. So this personal confrontation between Jesus and, uh, and Satan is the framework within which the drama takes place. And St. Paul, uh, who's very keen on theology as a means of driving the spirit. Uh, what 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 St. Paul does is to use theology to allow the spiritual experience to grow, um, rather than to impose one ideology on the other. There are of course two lions, George. Just as a footnote, there is there is the majestic lion, which Lewis chooses to use as an archetype of the father. But I think St. Peter probably had in mind the slinking desert lion, the kind of scroungy, mangy, mangy, scrawny, dangerous beast that prowls around in the half shadows, uh, hoping to get someone stupid enough to have wandered far enough away from the safe fire. But um, I, I partly helped provoke this conversation because I had a dream last night and George was worried that I hadn't been seeing my therapist enough to begin with, and with, I think, some very good reason. But but I reassured him and thought that I thought this wasn't a therapeutic dream. On the other hand, you, you know, I, I run the risk of some embarrassment in saying it, but it was very vivid. And what had happened was, in my dream, I, I suddenly recapitulated a piece of general synod debate that I saw. I, I replayed it. And there was a, a particular woman bishop who, who made a very powerful and distinctive speech um, her characteristic was was anger and rebuke, uh, and I remember thinking at the time, "Gosh, she does this really well. This is this is a this lady is quite a powerful personality." Um, but in my dream, uh, I I didn't know her name. Actually, I I did know her name then, uh, but I also knew her name in the dream. But but in the dream, it was saying, "You don't know her name. You need to find out her name." And I was scratching my head and thinking. What's her name? And then suddenly it came to me, and her name is Lilith. Now, and then the next thing that happened was, I can't even escape you guys when I'm asleep. You must go and tell them on Anglican Unscripted, Lilith is in the church. Lilith has arrived. Lilith is in there. And you have to get her out. Um, now, not everyone may know about Lilith, and indeed there's not a lot to know. <laughs> we're not but, talking about the character from Fraser, then. No, no, we're not. Nor, <laughs> nor even George MacDonald, who was C.S. Lewis's great mentor, wrote an interesting novel about Lilith. Mm. 
But Lilith has become a, a patron guru figure for the feminist movement. Uh, in Jewish mythology, um, which spun out into all kinds of exotic tales, um, and the, none, none of this has any biblical authority. This is this is imagery. It's metaphor. It's archetype. It's it's ways of talking about. It, it's ways of clothing experience with with narrative uh, form. Uh, so the, the the legend grew up that Eve was not Adam's first wife. Um, he'd had a first wife, and her name was Lilith, but she didn't like the plot uh, at all. And she was a very rebellious, very independent figure. And um, she wasn't willing to play part of the drama. And she walked out and had a life of her own. You can see why she immediately becomes a kind of patron saint of, of, of feminists. Um, and, and then she occupies a kind of this mystical zone of, of sort of Kabbalah and Jewish mythology. But the point is, she's, she is... Um, She's, she's archetypal, kick-ass, rebellious feminism. And and the, what the dream was about was to say, oh my goodness, this is a spirit that's got into the church. Um, you can use spirit at any level you like. If you're a, if, if you're a, a, a person who writes novels, then it's, the, then it's like an archetypal energy. If, if you're a charismatic, then it, it's, then it's a, real, a real thing that needs dealing with. And I... One of the things I think that people who often listen to conservatives don't understand is we're not bound by an ancient ideology that prepares old ideas to new ones, like a like you know a, a bunch of primitives huddled in the cave, frightened of progress in case it disturbs us. Um, it, it isn't that at all. It's it's because there is a project of purity, um, of spiritual spiritual purity and one of the things that we find in the gospels is satan comes to twist god's beautiful out of shape and so the reason for being a traditionalist rather than a progressive a charismatic rather than an intellectual is because what we want to do is to, is to guard the pure and the beautiful of spirit against against the twisting out of shape and against the besmirching and and it's i'd like i'd like i think to, to finish with one one final Idea. When I discovered this at some practical uh, application, I was with one of my students who had long graduated, was was in her late twenties, and she kept on leaving the Eucharistic community and 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 getting into New Age religion in in Brighton, where I was, and I was fed up with bringing her back. Goodness knows, we had conversations, I don't know, four or five times. It happened every two years, and as we were sitting talking in a car once, and I was saying, I, I was trying to ask her why she found the, the whole new age thing more compelling than the love of Jesus who had saved her. She had the most tremendous conversion experience in the chapel when she first came. I suddenly saw over her eyes what looked like a sort of reptilian skein. I can't quite describe it. It's like a third, a third level of, of transparent membrane over her eye that made it look reptilian. And I thought, oh my goodness, we're, we're dealing with a demon here. What what do I do? Because I'm used to arguing. I, I like arguing theology. I can argue. I'm at home in the in the Enlightenment arena, and so I thought, well, let's let's try something. Um, and she hadn't been listening to me for some time, so I began to speak to the demon, and I said, I can see you. I can see you in her eyes, and you 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 better get out and leave my friend alone. You have no business there. She belongs to Jesus. Just just un uncoil and and get out in the name of Jesus. And with my mouth, I I I prattled on hopelessly and and impotently <laughs> and she paid no and then during the course of the next 10 minutes her eyes began to clear um and at the end of the clearing period didn't matter what i was saying i was she suddenly said oh my goodness i've no idea what got into me why have i been behaving like this i couldn't resist it i said to her, i know what got into you <laughs> and, and and it's gone now and from that point in the conversation, she was back with her access to Jesus, and this irrational change of allegiance had 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 vanished. It had vaporized, and I thought those early charismatics were right. The demons get everywhere, and it's about time we addressed them. Now, when it, it, it's it's Ash Wednesday next week, and we're going to be renewing our baptism vows. What do our baptism vows say? They say, "I turn to Christ. Great. I repent of my sins." I renounce evil. 
Um, the, the, the problem with our concept of evil is we've bought into a mistranslation of the Lord's Prayer. The best Greek translation is, um, deliver us from, uh, uh, lead us not into temptation and deliver us from the evil one. But by by depersonalizing evil, by by mistaking the pronoun, the personal preferred pronoun, and turning it into an it instead of a he, we have taken away some of the sense of the baptismal authority to confront evil. And in a sense, that's the bit that Justin Welby was missing. He was absolutely right to be concerned that that evil had got a grip on the church. I may be not right about saying that the spirit of Lilith is in. Who knows? Um, one would have to test that out. But I woke up very alarmed that, that stuff had got into the church that needed to be kicked out. And the point about the progressive ideology is we're not against it because it's a new idea. We're against it because we believe that its origins are from the other side and that they twist and besmirch God's best intention for his people. And, and, and you come to that by repentance and rejecting evil. Now, George, there's a famous story from General Convention, I think it was in Minnesota, Minneapolis, uh, where somebody took salt to a, a, a diocesan table and the demons were really upset. Uh, can you uh, tell, remind me of that story? Well, actually, it was Philadelphia. Philadelphia? Okay, all right. The first General Convention to which I was accredited as a reporter was 1997. And I uh, knew, had been introduced to many of the leaders of the, uh, the American Anglican Council, was sort of leading the charge at that General Convention for the conservative movement. People may remember the name Roger Bolts. Um, and... I remember the Diocese of Newark and Fort Worth, their tables were adjacent to one another. Deputations at the General Convention sit at, at uh, long tables to face the podium. And each deputation has its own individual table with a little stand with the name of it raised above. And Newark and Fort Worth are right next to each other in the way the room was laid out. And during one of the breaks, a uh, priest whose first name is Nelson from the Fort Worth deputation took salt and sprinkled it around the Diocese of Fort Worth's desk and the Diocese of Newark's desk. And when this was observed, it was observed by a man named Louis Crew, who was a deputy from Newark, and who was the leader of Integrity at the time, which was the gay activist lobbying group. Crew went ballistic, and he involved presiding Bishop Frank Griswold, and we had the presiding bishop apologizing on behalf of the convention to Louis Crew in the Diocese of Newark. And the deputy was uh, basically urged to go home. And all I could think of is, and I witnessed this, and all I could think of is the biblical passage, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Where the response of, it was not just Newark that was singled out, it was Newark and Fort Worth had all salt spread around them to ward off the works and wiles of the enemy. And yet the response of the one man from Newark was hyper. I mean, I look and I hate to be hokey pokey, but looking at his face and his eyes and the foam flecking on his mouth as he's yelling about this, really, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? I mean, that. This is uh, not a dream. This is an actual event that occurred at General Convention, and it's uh, enshrined in myth, myth today by the liberals as an example of how mean conservatives are, trying to cast out the demon of homosexuality when they had nothing to do with that. But still, uh, I have to say, I've been to seven or eight General Conventions, and by and large, they're a very spiritually oppressive place for me. I, agree. I, have, I have a miserable time and it's not because they're expensive and the food is bad and you have to do a lot of walking but you walk into an environment that is just so evil i talked to a he's now a senior bishop in the acna but he was an episcopal bishop at the time this might have been 2003 or 2006 and he and I was covering the House of Bishops for the Living Church magazine, and I would sit in the back on a little table and take notes. And 
And I would chat with my acquaintances among the bishops. And after one particularly grueling session, uh, a, a diocesan bishop at that time came back to me and said, George, did you see, did you hear what that, and it was a woman bishop. And he said, you know, I was looking at her talking and she was waxing eloquent on why the Bible is wrong, the church tradition is wrong, we need to do free open the gates and bring in full gay blessings and this and that. He said, I just looked at her and I saw her neck was wrapped, had snakes wrapped around her neck and out of her mouth, her tongue was a snake. It was the head of an adder. And as she spoke, I could see the little, now this is a very rational, this is not, we all This is a charismatic guy, no, yeah. <laughs> this is not a charismatic. In fact, I'll give a hint, he's an Anglo-Catholic. For him, this vision that he had of this woman was of snakes, of e of pure poison and evil. And I've seen, uh, I, I did not see snakes, but people who I know to be competent, godly, intelligent people who have a charism in this area. For me, all I could feel was a sense of deep spiritual oppression that leads me to exhaustion. In these places, and the and when going home and just wanting to take a bath, uh, but no, I, the, I, the I, spiritual warfare in the church is alive. Uh, I went to the Columbus uh, uh, General Convention, and I was in there, and the spiritual oppression was just amazing. I I would sit in the press room, and you could just feel that you know, this is not godly. This is not people who are, who are deciding how to glorify God. It was people deciding how to glorify man and how to glorify culture and to affirm what they saw in culture. When I left Columbus, I was cha it changed me forever. It, my indwelling of, of church polity, of the, the spiritual wickedness that happens within the church. There was a meeting of General Synod at York around about 2012, and it was the meeting where uh, evangelical women and Anglo-Catholic women stood up and begged for a safe space in the church for traditional Christianity. Um, and it wasn't just they were denied it, but there was a there was a liberal um, project to use uh, niggling standing orders to, uh, to 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 refuse every single one of their requests. So I've forgotten exactly what the what the drama was, but it was a it was a pretty uh, tedious, pedantic, and unpleasant application of the, the standing orders of Synod. Uh, it was a terrible atmosphere. And every single every single one was voted down and 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 the Catholic women and the evangelical women were in were in tears at the treatment of it. And it was just a horrible, horrible event. And I was standing at the bus stop to take a bus back to the station and there was a particular woman clergyman there. Um, actually I, <laughs> I She's 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 been made a bishop since, um, and uh, we had a kind of conversation. I said something like, "Well, you know, that was really miserable." Miserable, she said. Um, it was more than miserable. Uh, it, it was designed to teach you a lesson. And I said, I, I'm, "I'm sorry. Why? What, what lesson were you trying to teach? Who?" She said, "We were taking revenge on you. We set out to take revenge on all of you." And I said, "I said, sister." In a Christian assembly, you sought revenge? You invoked vengeance? Yes, she said, and you got it. And I said, do, do, you not, do you not think there's something incongruous about Christians behaving like that together? No, she said, you got what you deserved, vengeance. And I went away thinking, I think that the spiritual implications of this are really rather serious. And and I mean, they're just they're just dreadful. But the problem is, I, I wished that that summed up only that afternoon. But but I don't think it did. I think it's an ongoing vengeance. There is there is a desire to, you know, and when Justin Welby stood up, God bless him and God help him. But to stood up and say, I'm ashamed of being a man. I'm ashamed of being straight. I'm ashamed of having gone to Eton. I'm ashamed of my degree. I'm ashamed of all my privileges. I, I wish I'd suffered as, you know, the opposite of all these things. This this is still part of the project of vengeance against what was the established order. And that's not to say that the power relations in our, in our defunct Judeo-Christian society 
have not been badly abused and badly used. But the answer is always repentance. It, it isn't taking vengeance on people that you feel have, have misbehaved. And I think that's the thing I would have wanted Welby to say. We're not here to beat our breasts and lament about having failed to be politically correct. We should lament about having invoked the spirit of vengeance and, and failed to truly repent spiritually uh, in our behavior of people we haven't understood. Part of part of what Gavin is saying, I, I have a small, very small piece of sympathy there for the woman who may have felt like an outsider for many years and now she's an insider. And not so, just an insider, she's a leader. She's a leader. So on one hand, I can sort of see, I can understand where she has come from. But her answer to the problem of what how she believed she was treated was to engage in the behavior that uh, she sought to excoriate among in others. Um, I've one of our standing jokes on this show is that uh, I talk about the episcopacy as a necessary evil that one puts up with. Well, in 25 years, I've never had a pastoral relationship. I've never had a spiritual relationship. I've never had even a social relationship with a bishop of my own bishop. Bishops are uh, administrators detached from the reality of life who every so often ask forms to be filled out or a request command prep for performance presence at a meeting or something. But bishops have no spiritual he heft or oomph to them. And whereas I find I found that spiritual heft in bishop surrogates. And the the issue that you know Gavin a part of the part of I think the failure of Anglicanism at this stage of its life is the failure of the episcopacy. Certainly a failure of the episcopacy to be fathers in God, for certainly to be standard bearers of the faith, certainly a failure to speak in love, but also I think a structural failure so of basically bishops being bureaucrats and administrators. I, Gavin, when we were discussing the show, Gavin shared his, I don't know whether you want to share this. Your, your, Too late. Uh, <laughs> Too late, Gavin. You're going to have to share this. Your experiences when you were asked, uh, to, you were your candidate to head up the House of Bishops. Uh, could, well, can, mind? before we get to Gavin, let's tell people the biblical narrative of a bishop is discipleship. He's there to disciple the clergy and uh, the clergy disciple their, their, their flock. That is my understanding, correct? It, it was Judas who held the money bag and was the administrator. Mm -hmm. uh, just, yes, I think I just... the problem is that the bishops <laughs> draw their heritage from the disciples, but they've picked the wrong disciple to emulate. Thought we clarify that. All right, Gavin, any experience you could relate? <laughs> I'd rather tell the story about a good bishop that I had once. It was Michael Marshall who 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 told me to go and hear the confession of a murderess who'd come to. To, to die in my parish and when he confirmed her she was too ill in his in her room he uh, he talked about his experience of 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 the angels that were in the room with her because this woman had has, as a murderess who'd blown her lover's head off with a double barrel shotgun but come to Jesus in prison her, her coming to Christ was such a her, she came with such power that it was impossible not to find yourself in the spirit um, and I think so I think George I'd say the problem with episcopacy is that, that if you're responsible for a structure of any kind, the temptation to do things in the flesh rather than the spirit is is, is hugely intensified. And, and so most of our bishops do things in the flesh and in structure. But there was a moment when I, I was uh, headhunted and asked to apply to become uh, Archbishop Secretary for the House of Bishops. And this meant training the bishops in the Church of England. And um, so I, I was phoned up and told I had to present myself to be interviewed um, and there were two days of of um, uh, perhaps I should tell how much of the story should I tell <laughs> let's tell, let's only tell a little bit of the story let's, 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 uh, let's uh, uh, err on safety um, the, very, the very the last interview was Dr. Grashen and if we appoint you to this strategically important position what would be your first act on Monday morning and I said well to tell you the truth, my experience of being a priest for about 30, 35 years is I've never heard one of my colleagues ever say he, he or she feels loved or understood or supported or befriended by his bishop. 
And I said, that's before you do anywhere, you have to have that. And all kinds of things can happen after that. But if you don't have that, you don't have anything. Uh, so I said, I would, I would clear every bishop's diary for Monday morning and they would go through their diocese, 10, 10 clergy at a time, and, inv and invite them into their house. And, and my interviewer, who was a bishop, sneered at me and said, and do what precisely? I said, well, that, that's easy. I said, um, have a Bible study, a cup of coffee, and a chat. And, you know, this means that when there's a crisis seven years down the road, they, they know each other, there have been conversations, and, and, and so on. So, a Bible study, he said, a cup of coffee. Yes, I said, and a chat. No, he shook his head. I'm very sorry, he said. I can't see the House of Bishops wanting to endorse such a programme. Do you have any other ideas? Well, yeah, I said, I do. Clear the diary, bring him in ten at a time, one every week. And I said, have a celebrate the Eucharist and give them a glass of sherry and a chat. The Eucharist, he said. A sherry, he said. And a chat, I said. They looked at me. And at this point, one of the interviewers was the head of human resources in the Church of England, a, a large woman. And she began to get this and she began to heave with mirth. And, 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 and she began to slip off her chair. And the end of the conversation, she was on the floor rocking with and crying with laughter, holding the, holding the table of, of, of the, 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 the table leg. And so the third, the third exchange was, anything else? I said, yes, I said, clear the diary, Monday mornings. Bring them in, 10 at a time. Uh, I said, well, make it an evening, maybe, if you like. I said, an evening of Victorian hymn singing, a cup of cocoa, and a chat. He said, Victorian hymn singing? Yeah, I said. Coco? Yes, and a chat. And he looked at me and said, I've no idea what you're trying to achieve. Uh, he said, none of, none of these ideas would ever appeal to any of the bishops in the Church of England. So I, I stared at him and I said, I said, oh dear, you seem to have chosen the wrong people to be bishops. <laughs> and and, and um, you won't be surprised to know that they didn't appoint me, they appointed consultants. Though I had some wonderful ideas. I, I had a special Episcopal YouTube channel lined up, which was going to interview Dawkins every time he said something and really put him <laughs> through, the, put him through the, the ringer with a really sharp-nosed intellectual, ideally me or perhaps somebody better. And then, you know, every bishop would have a 10-minute a succinct uh, um, the, the, the interview delivered to his box so he could talk about it on television or radio. We'd done all the hard work for him. I, I had some some good ideas. I I didn't get the post, and um, I, it doesn't seem that any of, of of the successors appear to have cracked the idea that the first thing a bishop has to do is to love their clergy. Uh, Gavin's uh, Gavin's experience is exactly mine. Um, my, my bishop will have people over to his home once every two years, maybe uh, a dozen, two dozen clergy and their spouses, and then he'll sort of retreat into a corner. And I'll basically talk to the people around me at my table. And there's no sense of knowing a bishop, having any sort of uh, sense of personal relationship or spiritual relationship or understanding better my profession or the work that I need to do. Um, the, the models that are put forward for the Episcopacy, and there are exceptions. Please don't hear us to say all oh, bishops. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no. Goodness, are, are tagged yeah. this way. But... I can only speak of my experiences, and I, I've, my bishops have been Charles Benison, Bob Duncan, Richard Harries, John Howe, and uh, Greg Brewer. And I, some I'd of like... these are dreadful theologically, some are wonderful theologically, but none of them put forward that central core of, you know, getting to know your clergy. And I'd like the, to hat tip, hat tip Peter Selby. Peter Selby was the very, very, very liberal bishop of Kingston, the Diocese of Southwark in the early 1980s, and I had a crisis of illness. And, and Peter Selby put his arm around me, loved me to bits, and helped me sort it out. And he was the most liberal, heretical bishop you can imagine. Peter Selby, you were, you were magnificent as a bishop, even if your theology oh, was dreadful. Bishop, we, I, need, we need to acknowledge the exception. I was a paraplegic in a nursing home. Uh, who was a working vic who was a working priest in charge of a parish um i got a card from the canon of the ordinary that's when you're searching around now but here's the amazing thing that's it here, here here i am i'm in my late 40s uh i have a family to raise my looks like my career is over i'm physically in great deal of pain i don't know what to do with my life i'm going through a tremendous crisis why is god punishing me destroying my body and I get a card 
from the, the can of the Oregon. Not a no. Get well soon. <laughs> no, but no, I, 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 I commend the can of the ordinary because he did something. But the bishop did nothing. And that's and but see that's that's the normal thing. If you have a life crisis, if your wife leaves you, if your child dies, if you've had something like that, in the Episcopal Church, of my experience, you don't go to your bishop. I would like to include that bishops are horrible administrators. They go to school for theology training and uh, go to seminary to learn about God and how to uh, understand uh, all to do with theology but they get no training in administration. They don't have MBAs. They don't come out of uh, any type of program where they are good bishops. So they, they kind of fail at, at two realms. They fail at the, the realm of having discipleship relationships with their priest, and they fail at the realm of administration because they don't know how to do that. It's not so part of the training. Bishops. And there are some bishops who learn to do nice. It's not a very, it's not an ingenious thing to get your parish secretary, your your bishop secretary, to have all the birthdays of your clergy's wives and mm -hmm. children, and send them a note each time. It sure. can be done, but so they they've managed nice. But we're straying away, I think, a bit from from uh, you know we've we've done theology. We talked about theology and therapy. This, in a sense, is an, an aspect of therapy. It's about affirmation and kindness and acceptance and inclusion. But, but still a million miles away from, uh, from, from the, the, the shtaretz, the elder, the, the man of the spirit, who knows that there is a metaphysical struggle going on and stands at the front of the storm uh, to take the brunt with his, with his clergy. The, the, the problem is that not only do they not do theology well, they don't they don't even do nice well, but they're really not doing the life of the spirit at all well either. And the problem is we're losing in the life of the spirit. You know, Lilith may very well have got in and and um spiritually speaking, I'm sure I'm sure the, the lady bishop I dreamt about may be an absolutely wonderful lady in her real life. No, uh, she's not. No, she's not. No, Gavin. Um, <laughs> no, you're being nice. No, she's not. <laughs> yeah. Well, hold but, on. But, Let, but 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 you know, the, the, we we have a spiritual battle, and maybe as we come to Lent, you know, one of the things we should be doing is 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 confronting the devil in his own game, casting him out, you know, by salt, by holy water, by the by by the name of Jesus. Um, uh, the tradition I've now entered in has a whole lot of other other things which I won't bring to Anglican unscripted lest I upset people. But it's the same project to 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 clear some holy space and to eject the corruption, the perversion, the besmirchment. No, I mainly, actually mainly want, by I want I want you to bring something out because what you've shared about Mark, I forget his last name, Shrewsbury, um, your new bishop, Mark. Yes, Bishop Mark Davis. Yes, uh, his. Uh, his Sunday practice. Well, it was it was it was extraordinary. Um, so the, the diocese has a has has several dozen ordinands in training. It's quite a lot for a diocese. He's 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 saying he has twice as many clergy coming for the Catholic priesthood as, as any other diocese in the country. And before they go to seminary, they there are a group of men again, another one or two dozen who live around the cathedral monastically. As to see whether they're ready to, to to be have to have a vacation to go in seminary, and they. Um, uh, um, I, I first learned about the bishop from a, a rather rich engineer who'd been an Episcopalian and become a Catholic, and so you know we ex Anglicans who become Catholics have eat together, and he said one of the things that moved him most of all was he's an insomniac, my friend, the engineer, and um, the the Catholic cathedral has a has a, a live camp. And he said, I'm up and up at four and five in the morning, as, as often rich and clever insomniacs are. And he said, I, I would occasionally look at the live cam. And there he said, at five in the morning, I would see the bishop flat in front of the altar praying. And I, I was impressed, he said, because not many of the Anglican bishops I've known could be found in their cathedrals prostrate before Jesus at five in the morning on a semi-regular basis. But my experience was we, I was invited to lunch. Uh, and and lunch was the bishop with his pre-seminarians, about fifteen of them round a table, and we had a good lunch. We ate and we drank, and then at the end of the table, the, the meal, they said, "Right, well, let's go and spend. We've enjoyed each other's company. Now, now let's go and spend some time with Jesus." And I thought, "What is this? What are they talking about?" And then they all went upstairs to the to the the chapel in this in, in this building next to the cathedral where the Blessed Sacrament was reserved, 
and everyone then got onto their knees and in half an hour for half an hour uh spent time in adoration for the blessed sacrament now leaving aside the theology whether jesus is there or not guys don't don't go there <laughs> it doesn't matter the, the point was their heart was to spend time in the presence of jesus at the end of a meal and it was the most natural thing in the world and i have to say again no 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 anglican church meeting i've ever been in or no meal has ended with people saying we're off to get on our knees and spend half an hour together quietly in the presence of jesus i was very impressed gavin i i want to say that i've had that experience and i had that experience in the 1998 lambeth conference and kevin and i think kevin and i may have had that experience in alexandria i don't know if you were yep, I was there. Huh? at the lambeth conference uh they have national dinners every so often and the americans were having a, a dinner dance and uh, they had music and cocktails and and after one meal uh but the africa but the africans and the evangelicals and the anglo-catholics were after meals would gather in the chapel just to sit and pray with each other mm. and i remember i was invited by keith ackerman to come with him and keith ackerman sat out the american dip bishop's dinner and just we were all seated in the chapel praying quiet we were basically before jesus except there wasn't mm. keith ackerman would have had the uh expo bless his sacrament exposed. <laughs> but the nigerians i don't think that would have uh, been good for them but it, for me <laughs> what i all i could think of was that scene from the movie dr shivago of the aristocrats dancing away in the ballroom while the peasants are marching in the streets and they're cold and they're hungry because you could pray and you could hear and you would and at the background, you could hear pop music and the clinking of glasses and sort of shrill laughter. And the other experience I could remember. But George, just before you stop, George, life in the flesh and life in the spirit. That, that, yeah. that, that's, that, that's the dichotomy. You've described it perfectly. And, yeah, well. and, and then Kevin and I went, were one of the two, we were one of the three or four reporters who attended the primates gathering in Alexandria, which was in an Egyptian hotel. And because there were few, so few reporters there, and we actually had gotten to know many of the primates, uh, we moved easily amongst them. And I can remember they had sort of a lounge area, and Henry Arambi and Greg Venables and Benjamin and Zimbi of Kenya, and two or three other bishops were seated there. And I think I came up, and I can't remember if you were with me, Kevin. I think you were, because we didn't have much to do. And I essentially said, what are you doing? They said, well, we're praying to come join us and pray. And we just sat there and prayed in a public yeah. lobby. And this was something that I've never actually seen at a general convention or a <laughs> House of Bishops meeting or, uh, or a diocesan convention. But the, the, the example that Gavin, you gave of life lived in the spirit of the Catholic Church has its counterparts in the Anglican world, different well, ways of, of course. Living. Yeah, of course. But, well, but, but, what that is, but that life in the spirit is missing from th this is seen as sort of a quaint little oddity rather than the okay, central please, purpose or life of it please please let nobody hear me saying that 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 catholics live in the spirit more than other people i wasn't saying that for a moment i, I was it's just that we had a conversation sure. and, no, no. and that 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 was a an episode i don't hear you was, saying that um, no, but but some people in the comments will oh, <laughs> i know the catholics were pickled in the spirit <laughs> But 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 George, you're absolutely right. It's it doesn't matter what the denomination is. The call and the, the purpose of the denomination should be to facilitate this life in the spirit. And and going back to to general synod and to our, our conversations, yes, we have to do theology. Yes, we have to do some therapy. But these are inci not incidental. They they the, the heart is this struggle for the kingdom of heaven between good and evil, where we confront the enemy of Jesus with. With with all the help we can get, and some of us that extends to the St. Michael the Archangel, um, but but it's that confrontation. And if we if we can learn anything from the Charismatics, you know, they got there first. They they remembered the ancient script in our generation before a lot of others did. To to sum up, and you guys can help me out here, but the reality is, if you think the climate is the emergency, or you think gender is the emergency, or you think whatever. Uh, virtue signaling you can handle is the emergency of the day the problem mm. is you forgot who your enemy is the war is a spiritual war and it has declared a war on you your church your belief your faith your friends 
and you need to identify who your enemy is so that you can fight this war. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. We turn to Christ, we repent of our sins, we renounce evil, and you've been listening to Anglican Unscripted episode 576, which I hope may act as a help in, in, the, in the venture. God bless you.